We have covered the arbitrary or capricious standard and the Chevron doctrine. We turn now to the substantial evidence standard of review. Notice that by the terms of the APA, this substantial evidence standard of judicial review applies only where certain formal procedures are required of the agency in taking a certain type of action. Where it applies, it is often said to take the place of the arbitrary or capricious standard. The substantial evidence standard is generally believed to be more exacting of the agency, and so presumably an agency action that lacked substantial evidence to support it in the record required of formal proceedings would of course be an arbitrary and capricious action to take. That said, it is not hard to think up a case in which there was substantial evidence in the record, but the agency acted arbitrary or capriciously anyway. Same idea we've seen before in connection with Chevron analysis. An agency that switches between reasonable interpretations by coin toss every six months acts arbitrary or capriciously. So also, an agency that has a solid evidentiary basis for an action can act arbitrarily and capriciously if it acts on the basis of something utterly irrelevant. It is important to know what is meant by formal proceeding. The APA itself does not use the term formal, but courts and administrative lawyers use it as a shorthand for a proceeding required to be conducted according to Section 556-557 procedures. By that same token, informal has come to mean not subject to Section 556-557 procedural requirements. As we have noted, the universe of agency actions is divided into two types, rulemakings and adjudications. Every agency action is one or the other, a rulemaking or an adjudication. The two distinctions, formal, informal, and rulemaking adjudication cut across each other. As a result, every agency action falls into one and only one of the four boxes depicted above. Contrary to an erroneous dictum in Overton Park, sections 556-557 procedures might apply either to a rulemaking or an adjudication. Because they are trial-like in nature, as we shall see later in the semester, section 556-557 procedures seem naturally suited to adjudicative proceedings. But Congress sometimes requires an agency to make rules not under the informal notice and comment rulemaking procedures set out in section 553, but under formal section 556-557 procedures. The table is one that we will return to again and again during the semester. It gives us the big picture of the APA structure. The Universal Camera Saga gives us an opportunity to explore what the substantial evidence standard means. The saga begins with the Wagner Act, which was created, which created the National Labor Relations Board, or the NLRB, which Congress set the t to the task of promoting labor peace while protecting the right of workers to organize and to bargain collectively with larger employers. The NLRB consists of five members but its responsibilities extend to millions of workers and tens of thousands of employers. It has power to determine whether unfair labor practices have occurred, as determined in formal adjudicatory, that is section 556-557 proceedings. The process normally begins with the investigation of complaints, of which there were 20,000 in a recent year, 2015. Of these, 1,200 were set for hearing. Obviously, the board would be overwhelmed if its five members had to hear 1,200 unfair labor practice complaints a year. Congress has therefore staffed the NLRB with 35 administrative law judges, or ALJs, to assist the board with this caseload. Each ALJ has roughly 35 cases a year to hear. That's a lot but more manageable than 1,200 a year. At the conclusion of hearings, unless the parties settle, the ALJ prepares a recommended report and order for the full board. The board then makes its decision, exercising all the powers it would have 
had it actually presided at the hearing. Notice the double layer of for-cause protection. Recall that the constitutionality of this double layer is in question now in the aftermath of Free Enterf Enterprise Fund and Lucia. By executive order, President Trump has declared the entire core of federal ALJs to be exempt from the competitive civil service. That is but a short step from declaring that ALJs, as officers of the United States, are subject to the President's plenary power of dismissal. That is precisely what Chief Justice Taft declared in dictum in Myers. For now, assume that the board is in a role somewhat like that of the commander of a small army, but it has few of the usual powers that a commander has over troops. The four cause protection the NLRB's ALJs have, customarily enjoyed, gives them a degree of independence. The NLRB has no summary power to remove or to discipline its ALJs. A separate federal agency, the Merit Systems Protection Board, adjudicates issues pertaining to ALJ performance, but this can be problematic. There's a principal agent problem lurking here. The problem of motivating one party, the agent, to act on behalf of another, the principal. Agency problems arise when the incentives between the agent and the principal are not perfectly aligned. Why can the agent get away with not acting in the best interest of the principal? One reason is that the cost is too high to the principal of removing or punishing the agent relative to the benefit. Even when the board itself or a majority is agreed on general matters of practice and policy, it may have difficulty in marshalling the ALJ core in carrying it out. This brings us to universal camera. To appreciate what is at stake, it is helpful to review the facts. This depicts the chain of command in the plant. Notice that Chairman, that's his name, not his title, answers to Pollitzer, the plant engineer, and Pollitzer in turn answers to Kende, the chief engineer. Weintraub does not have authority to supervise Chairman, nor does Weintraub have authority to supervise the maintenance workers under Chairman's supervision. This is our cast of characters. The hearing before the ALJ revealed the following events moving from left to right on a timeline. On November 30, Chairman testified before the NLRB on behalf of his men. Ken Day, who was present, was furious and called Chairman a liar. Later that day, Ken Day, still furious, tells Weintraub to find some reason to fire Chairman, who must be a communist. Why didn't Kende simply fire Chairman on the spot? That's easy. That would be unlawful. Shortly thereafter, Pollitzer, Chairman's supervisor, defended him. And Weintraub had to report to Kende that there were no grounds for firing Chairman. New Year's Eve rolls around. On the shop floor, Weintraub orders Chairman to send one of the maintenance men home. This is outside the chain of command. Chairman refuses. Weintraub insists and Chairman tells Weintraub he must be drunk. At this point, the testimony of the two men is irreconcilable. Weintraub testified that he then ordered Chairman out of the plant. Chairman testified that the two shook hands. The ALJ credited Chairman's story. The two men shook hands. Odd. Maybe Weintraub thought he had all he needed now on Chairman. Right after New Year's, Weintraub ordered Pollitzer to fire Chairman. Pollitzer replied that Chairman was quitting anyway, so there was no need. The ALJ concluded that Chairman had never said this, but that Pollitzer had either made it up to avoid unpleasantness or had somehow misunderstood Chairman. Weeks pass. Weintraub sees that Chairman is still there and orders Pollitzer to fire Chairman. Pollitzer balks, and Kendi orders Pollitzer to fire Chairman. Chairman is fired allegedly only for saying Weintraub was drunk on New Year's Eve. The ALJ's report acknowledged that Ken Day was still resentful of Chairman for testifying before the board in November, but assigned Chairman's conduct on New Year's Eve as Ken Day's only reason for firing Chairman. If that was the only reason, why wait three weeks? Waiting made perfect sense if the firing was pretextual. 
The ALJ report found that Pulitzer made up the story about Chairman's voluntary departure in hopes of avoiding trouble. Weintraub, believing Pulitzer, expected Chairman to have gone, and when Pulitzer found Chairman still in the plant, did what he would have done on the 2nd of January, but for Pulitzer's story. That is, Weintraub found Chairman still in the plant. The full board thought that the ALJ had failed to see through the company's pretext for firing a maintenance supervisor who was encouraging his men to organize a bargaining unit. The board, reading 1,200 recommended decisions a year, perhaps saw a pattern? Or did it fear that a precedent might be set? The board found that the company had committed an unfair labor practice and ordered chairman reinstated with back pay. The company did not comply, and so the board sought enforcement in the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Judge Learned Hand wrote an opinion enforcing the board's order, and Universal Camera appealed to the United States Supreme Court, which, with Justice Frankfurter writing for the court, remanded to the Second Circuit for further proceedings. On the, the remand, Judge Hand wrote again. This time, the panel included Judge Jerome Frank, one of the legal realists. This time, the Second Circuit set aside the board's order as lacking substantial evidence in the record as a whole. We want to understand why. Surely it would not have been arbitrary and capricious for the board to find an unfair labor practice, so maybe we have been handed the key to understanding how the substantial evidence standard differs in stringency from arbitrary or capricious. We have three of the greatest American jurists, Felix Frankfurter, Learned Hand, and Jerome Frank, to show us the way. The company alleged two errors. As to alleged error one, the entire court joined in holding the Second Circuit erred in thinking the ALJ report had to be ignored. This part seems easy since the APA explicitly states that the ALJ report is a part of the record and that judicial review is to be based on the whole record or parts of it cited by a party. If there were any doubt about it, the court made clear that the agency could not simply point to some part of the record and ask the reviewing court to look only at that. As to alleged error two, the court found no error in the Second Circuit's finding substantial evidence elsewhere in the record. But the court held that the Second Circuit should look again on remand to determine whether what it had thought substantial became less so when the ALJ's conclusion as to motive were brought into view. Justices Black and Douglas thought this was unnecessary. The idea that any scintilla of evidence could be blown up in isolation into substantial evidence had already been rejected. Substantial evidence is more than a mere scintilla. In his first opinion for the panel, Judge Hand struggled to decide what was the best analogy. Was the reviewing court to treat the board as the finder of fact, or should it treat the board as a lower court taking an issue away from the finder of fact, as, in, as if granting J and OV? Judge Hand, the first time around, decided that the board was to be treated as the finder of fact, that is, very deferentially. If, by special verdict, a jury had made the express finding of the board's majority, we should not reverse the verdict by granting JNOV. And we understand our function in this, to be in the, in this case of this kind to be the same. But then he added unnecessarily that the ALJ's recommendation was to be simply ignored, as though the ALJ were a stenographer and not a witness. On the appeal, Justice Frank Frager, writing for the majority, did not agree with Judge Hand's choice of analogy. The substantial evidence standard is not modified in any way when the board and its examiner disagree. But in remanding, he suggested that the ALJ's conclusion as to witness veracity ought to be taken seriously. 
Evidence supporting a conclusion may be less substantial when an impartial, experienced examiner has observed the witnesses and lived with the case and has drawn conclusions different from the board. The ALJ has seen the witnesses and had an opportunity to assess their demeanor, which the board had not. On the remand, Judge Hand misunderstood the court to be saying that the ALJ, rather than the board, should be treated as the finder of fact. He wrote, an examiner's finding on veracity may, must not be overruled without a very substantial preponderance of testimony as recorded. In his separate concurrence, Judge Frank, with elaborate tact, worried that Judge Hand, then age 79, had misunderstood the reason for the Supreme Court's remand. The APA makes it plain that an agency that uses ALJs does not surrender any of the powers it would have if it had presided at the hearing itself, and that includes the power to find facts. This is unlike a federal district court bringing in a master in equity. When a district court brings in a master in equity, the master becomes the fact finder, and the master's findings are to be set as not to be set aside unless clearly erroneous. Allentown Mac and other cases make it very clear that the board, not the ALJ, as the, is treated as the fact finder under the substantial evidence standard as the court wrote. We must decide whether the board's conclusion is supported by substantial evidence on the record as a whole. Put differently, we must decide on this record whether on this record it would have been possible for a reasonable jury to reach the board's conclusion. The question presented for review, therefore, is whether on the evidence presented to the board a reasonable jury could have found that fact. This clarity comes, however, at the price of unclarity elsewhere. How is the substantial evidence standard any more stringent than arbitrary and capricious? After all, no reasonable fact finder could conclude it is hard to distinguish from only an arbitrary and capricious fact finder could conclude. It may be that we should content ourselves with understanding the difference not in terms of stringency, but in terms of the different contexts in which the two standards typically apply. The substantial evidence test is tailored to agency decisions made by means of the formal trial-type proceedings set out in sections 556 and 557. The arbitrary and capricious standard applies to everything else. So a dispute about whether the substantial evidence standard has to be met is really a dispute about whether APA section 556-557 applies. And that is a question we will take up in a couple of weeks. Query. Would a court's treating the ALJ as the jury rather than as a witness aggravate a principal agent problem for the agency with respect to its ALJs? Busy district courts that farm out fact-finding to masters in equity have to accept their findings unless clearly erroneous. erroneous. This isn't a problem because a. district courts rarely appoint masters and b. district courts are not on any special mission. But agencies have to rely on ALJs all the time and agencies are on a mission, namely the mission that Congress assigned them. In the case of the NLRB, that mission is to protect workplace rights nationally. Had Allentown Mack and other cases not clarified that the agency, not its ALJs, are to be viewed as the fact finders, then agencies like the Labor Board would have less control over policy. This is particularly true of the Labor Board, which, as we will soon see, has traditionally made policy by common law style adjudication rather than by using its notice and comment rulemaking power.